Good morning, everyone. Yeah, it's a good morning. We need the rain, so don't be, I don't know, I don't understand because, you know, I got the sunshine of God on the inside of me, so rain doesn't bother me. You know, clouds don't bother me. Praise God, the sun is always shining on the inside of me. Glory to God. It can be for you too. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Well, we've been talking, which this has morphed into something I did not expect. We've been doing a fairly lengthy study on blood covenant. And, and then we began looking is that because a blood covenant is a legal agreement, we found out God does everything how? Legally. You know, I, w I was even thinking today, because, you know, you hear songs on Christian radio and you hear even, even some of the announcers talk about, well, God paid a price that we couldn't pay and we owed a debt that, that we couldn't pay. And, and, and I'm going, okay, based on what? See, if there is sin, then there was a price to pay. But see, it's all based on legality. And God had to pay that price legally, and that's why Jesus had to be born of a virgin, come here and live a sinless life so that he could set, shed sinless, innocent blood, which would legally undo what Adam did. Hence his name, the last Adam. Amen. So even that, I mean, even the death of Jesus doesn't make any sense unless there was legal necessity for him to do so. Just think about the prayer he prayed. He said, Father, if there be some other way, let this cup pass from me. I mean, he's going, man, I'm looking at this thing. This thing is rough. I, I really would like some other way. But there was no other legal way to pay the price. And that's why he could boldly say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's why you can, you see, if you don't understand sin, then the other religions of the world don't seem so bad. But when you understand sin, there was no way for the other religions of the world to pay the price for our sin. And therefore, there was no way to God. And there is no way to God for other religions of the world. You say, well, you're, you're pretty narrow-minded. No. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He said, the way is narrow. The way is narrow. And the gate is narrow that, in how you enter into life. Matthew 7. He said, wide is the way and broad is the path that leads to destruction. And many there be that go in thereat. So a lot of people are, are taking that broad path. But thank God because of the truth that's being shed forth and shown forth. Glory to God, we're beginning to, to see many more people come to him. Amen. Now, we've been talking then specifically about prayer and how prayer is what? It, it's, it has to do with covenant. Do you remember the definition? A legal transaction, a legal blood covenant transaction. Thank you, Mike. A legal blood covenant transaction. So I think people, if you've gotten this religious idea of prayer is just kind of, you know, you know, you still hear preachers say, you know, storm the gates of heaven, bombard the gates of heaven. <laughs> Why? Okay. Think about this. I mean, how would the judge in a courtroom if, if you came in and tried to bombard the courtroom with your testimony or something, I mean, he'd look at you, probably throw you a bailiff, get rid of that person right there. Order in the court, you know? Right? Because that's, that's not necessary. When you come legally, 
You can come boldly, but you don't have to try to wear God down or, you know, try to storm the gates of heaven. The gates of heaven are open to us. Amen. So we, we saw that we use the prayer of faith for what reason? To receive his promises. And all of his promises are yes and amen to us. So anything God promises, we can receive. So what does the prayer of faith do? It reaches into the spiritual realm and brings that from the spiritual realm into the natural realm. We need it here. We've got exceeding, exceedingly great and precious promises, but they don't do us any good if we don't know how to get them from the spiritual realm to where we need them. Now, thank God, you know, evangelical Christianity has learned that you use the sinner's prayer to come to Jesus. Right? That's a legal transaction. Well, they, then they forget about that and try to use a lot of other things to receive other things from God. It just is kind of a hit or miss situation. I pointed out last week that John Wesley, the great Methodist revivalist, I mean, he really changed the world with the, 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 it was the move of God of that day. John and Charles Wesley, his brother. He said this, it seems as though God can do nothing except someone ask him. And then he said, why this is, I do not know. He did not have spiritual understanding to understand that God does everything legally. You see, just as we need God to transact what Jesus bought and paid for, God needs us to pray. To, he uses our authority from Christ and the fact that we have a body which gives us authority to be here on the earth. It's a legal way to enter the earth. He uses that double authority to release his ability into the earth. That's what prayer does. It releases his ability. Whether it's prayer of faith for you, prayer of agreement for someone else, Amen. Supplications, intercessions, prayer of consecration, dedication to the will of the Lord, prayer of casting your cares upon the Lord, united prayer, the prayer of praise and worship. Glory to God. No matter what you're praying, your transaction, you're releasing God's ability into the earth. We're going to look at all these really more in detail today and really hopefully we'll get to the end of it. I don't get on too many rabbit trails. Okay. Now, we pointed out that there are, are several kinds of prayer. Turn to Ephesians 6. I just want to show you. Ephesians chapter 6. Verse 18, praying always with all some translations say kinds of prayer, or some say all manner of prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. So we're making spiritual transactions. We're making a difference. It's why we have Wednesday night prayer, why we have Saturday night prayer. We're praying specifically because I'll tell you, our country is in dire trouble. I remember that thought because I'm going to point out something maybe you've heard, maybe you haven't heard later on. Okay? Um, so there's kinds of prayer. All right? We, we looked at 1 Timothy 2. Let's just turn there real quick because I want you to see that God is, he says this to us, 1 Timothy 2, verse 1, Therefore I exhort, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, or we would say presidents, for all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved, to come to the knowledge of the truth. Supplications. We talked about that's reminding God of his word. Prayers. We're, we're going to talk about the different kinds of prayers. Intercessions. 
Intercessions is not something you could just decide to do on your own. Intercessions is initiated by the Holy Spirit. That's Romans 8, 26 and 27. And of course, giving of thanks. We can't ever forget to give thanks. All right. So notice he says, I exhort therefore, first of all, this is a prior, this is something God needs from us to pray. Amen. What does it say in James 5, 16? He says, the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man, that's you and me, we're, we're made righteous by the blood of Jesus, avails much. You know what that means in the Greek? Makes great power available, dynamic in its working. If we do this right, that's exactly the result that's going to happen. Great power is going to be made available, dynamic in its working. Amen. Amen. All right. Now, we can't take the rules from one kind of prayer and, and transfer it over to another kind of prayer. Remember the prayer of consecration and dedication that Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane? Remember, he got down on his knees and for an hour, basically, he, it's capsulated like this. Father, if it be possible. Let this cup pass from me, this cup of suffering, this cup of obedience that I have, you've given for me, this cup of suffering. If it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. See, that is a necessity for consecration, dedication to the will of God. This is not the revealed will that we have in the word of God, because we already know that. But this is the hidden will. What's God's plan for your life? What exactly does he expect from you? When you make Jesus Lord of your life, you're not your own anymore. You're his. To follow his plan. I was playing college football when I got saved, baptized with the Holy Ghost, and began to know how to be led by the Holy Spirit. And my coach, my football coach there at college at that time, University of Minnesota Crookston was only a two-year college. And uh, as captain of the football team and so on and so forth, he told me, he said, come up to my office. He said, you got five four-year offers. Five four-year offers. <laughs> you know what? God wouldn't even let me go because I'd have been tempted. I, to this day, I still don't know what colleges would have made offers to me. Amen. Why? Because God had a different plan. When I get to heaven, I'll figure, you know, I might, if I'm still curious, I probably won't even care then. But, you know, if I do, I can always find out then. But until then, it's just part. It, it's, it's part of what I left behind to follow him. Amen. Okay? So, Each kind of prayer has a specific legal exchange purpose. Okay, let's go over them but one by one. First of all, the prayer of faith is the legal way to obtain any of the blood covenant promises from God. Look at Hebrews 6. Hebrews 6, just a little bit ahead. Hebrews 6, verse 12. And see, now... Somehow, religious teaching, I'm talking about religious Christian teaching, has this idea that, well, you know, you, you don't want to be too persistent in asking God. You know, you, you can't ask for too much. That's baloney. Whatever you have need of, and even beyond sometimes, as, as the Lord leads, wants. God wants to bless you. Yes. Notice this, Hebrews 6, verse 12 that you do not become sluggish, lazy, slothful. But what? But imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. God wants you to inherit the promises. Do you know God is glorified when you get answers to prayer? The devil's the one that doesn't want you to get answers to prayer. Those promises belong to you. Every single one of them. Promises of healing, promises of prosperity, 
Amen. Promises of overcoming every circumstance and every situation you deal with. Amen. He's got promises to cover anything you might need. Promises of strength. Glory to God. Look at Mark 11 now. This is the prayer of faith. Mark 11. But I'll tell you, you, you know, if you look at this thing on the surface, you don't get it right away. Because this, this it, you, you've got to meditate on this some. Notice verse 24. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe you receive them and you will have them. The prayer of faith is you believe, you receive. That means by faith, you take it into your possession when? Now. Faith is always now. Always. Amen. And what will happen? And you shall have it. That means in, in you know... Varying degrees of time, you shall have it. Well, how long is it going to be? Don't get focused on time. I'll tell you, if you get focused on time, you're out of the now. Some things I've been standing for for a while, I don't care. It's mine now. Yeah, but you've been standing a long time. And Unless I sense the Holy Spirit showing me I'm doing something wrong, it's mine now. I'm not going to cast away my confidence at any time because it's mine now. It's not mine when, when it, the manifestation comes, it's mine now. It better be yours. It has to be yours now before it ever comes into manifestation. See, again, you got to quit thinking physical. You got to think spiritual. It's yours now. Why? Because Jesus bought and paid for it. And when you lay hold of it by faith, it's yours. You're drawing that through your confession, through your thanks and praise, through your believing in your heart. It draws it from the spiritual realm. I'm sure it seemed like a long time for Abraham, 25 years he stood on the promise, God said, I have made you a father of many nations. He had no children. 25 years. But he was strong in faith. The Bible says he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. Oh, he had a couple little detours. Tried to help God out. Produced the whole Muslim nation, the whole Arab nation. Because the Arabs are the descendants of Ishmael. That's right. So when we try to help God out, we get an Ishmael, and usually the Ishmael comes back to bite us in the backside. Mm hmm. So let's stay away from the Ishmael. This is why begging, crying, storming the gates of heaven all don't work in obtaining from God consistently. The prayer of faith can and will receive any and all of God's blood covenant promises if prayed according to the blood covenant principles that I just laid up. The prayer of faith works how many times? All the time. Number two, prayer of agreement. Prayer of agreement is a legal way to use your faith to obtain the blood covenant promises of God for someone else. As long as you can get them to agree with you. Not just mentally assent, and that's the thing you have to be careful. You got to get them to have faith in your faith. Well, why don't you just teach them the word? Well, there may not be time. May not have time to teach them the word. Your faith can work on their behalf. Amen. I remember Scott Monsrud's dad. You know, I, Scott said, or asked Scott one day at, at networking, how, how are you doing? Well, not so good. My dad's in the hospital and He's got some serious problems and, you know. And I said, well, you want me to come pray for him? He brightened up and he said, yeah. And so we went up to Mercy Hospital and uh, walked into his room, started talking to him. 
And he's a believer. But he didn't understand, you know, the principles. But the thing that, that happened is I got him to have faith in my faith. He still wasn't necessarily in faith, but he believed that when I prayed, I'd get results. I laid hands on him, and the power of God filled that room. And within an hour, he's up. They were talking about, you know, there's all these surgeries and stuff. Within an hour, he's up walking around. And what was it, a week later, he came and visited the church. Glory to God. So, you know, my faith worked on his behalf because he agreed with me. He symphonized with me. That's what the word agreement there means. It means to symphonize. That's in word and in thought and heart. Amen. Number three, the prayer of casting your cares upon the Lord. So what kind of legal exchange is this? This is a good one, boy, I'll tell you. This is a legal way to cast or throw worries, anxieties, frets, stresses over on the Lord and leave them with him. Instead of looking at and live, worry, anxiety, and stress is a form of fear. Instead of looking at and living by and trusting the word of God, the blood covenant, the worrier is looking at circumstances and what they are telling them instead of allowing the word of God to be their root and it makes them anxious. Look at Philippians chapter 4. I mean, you know, one of the things that people have done to try to get away to feel like they're not worrying is call worry stress. Or fretting. That's still worry. Okay? And doctors will tell you that worry, stress, whatever, puts pressure on your body. Why? Because worry causes you to produce what? Adrenaline. You, and, and see, that's why a lot of people that worry get arthritis because it puts stress and it, it affects your joints particularly. Amen. My grandma Anderson, when you meet her in heaven, she is one of the nicest, sweetest, gentlest ladies you'll ever meet. But she was a champion worrier. I say, Grandma, why do you worry so much? Well, I don't know. It's just what I do. And I mean, everything was going good at one point, and 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 she was asking about stuff, and I said, Grandma, what are you doing? Well, I don't really have anything to worry about because I'm kind of asking to see if there's something I need to worry about. I mean, it's just like she was so addicted to worry, she didn't know how to live without worry. And I think I said, you know, that she went from like, she was fairly tall for a woman, 5'8", went down to about 5'2". She just shrunk. She had severe rheumatoid arthritis. She just shrunk. Amen. Look at Philippians 4, verse 6. Be anxious for nothing or about nothing, but in everything, how? By prayer and supplication. By legal transaction, reminding God of what his word says, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Now see, this, this is the substitute. So you cast your cares over on the Lord, 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all your cares upon the Lord because he what? Cares for you. So you exchange your worries for answers. And notice what else, verse 7, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So you give cares to him, you leave them there. It's like one preacher said, 
You know, don't go to God and cast your cares, but then pick them up when you leave. That's not casting your cares at all. There's no exchange. That's what some people do. Amen. You cast your cares and you take peace with you. And peace is much better than worry, anxiety, and stress. Amen? So it's a legal exchange. Amen. How often do we pray this prayer? As many times as you need it. I'll tell you, after a while you get tired of casting your cares on the Lord. You'll leave them there. How many times do you pray the prayer of faith? Once. Anything more than once is unbelief. That's why if you, heard, if you believe you received, why are you going to pray again? Thank you for that mighty shout of amens there. Okay. So different rules again. So exchange worries for the peace of God. Number four. The prayer of commitment or consecration and dedication to the will of God. A legal way to exchange our unwillingness, reluctance, and even rebellion to the will of God for God's grace, strength, and ability to obey and clarity as, what exa- as to what God exactly God wants us to do. Okay? Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. He said, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. So again, he was not sure if there was some other way. I mean, he'd been declaring that this is what he was going to do, but all of a sudden, now he's facing this thing and he's going, oof. His humanity is going, this is tough. It's the toughest thing any person has ever undertook. And so... He was experiencing some reluctance to completing the mission he was sent to do. This is understandable. If God is asking you to do something, you're experiencing some reluctance, some unwillingness, or maybe even some rebellion. This is the prayer you must pray in order to exchange those things for grace, willingness, and the strength to do it. And you might go, I mean, Jed might, God might be speaking to Jed about something and he goes, Oh, Father, if it would be possible, can, 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 can I do something else? I mean, I'm looking at this. I don't know if I'm much of want to do this. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. It's not our choice. Not when we're really following God. Not if we really want to have the rewards of well done, good and faithful servant. Amen. Now, how long did this prayer last? This is just a capsulization. The whole thing lasted three hours, but this verse capsulizes how long? One hour. Because he prayed three times. And the prayer morphs. I want you to notice this. Go back to Matthew 26. Let's see, I want you to notice how the prayer morphs in a good way. It changes. Notice the first one, I've quoted this. Verse 39, went a little farther and fell on his face, prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And then he came and found his disciples asleep. He said, What could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The Spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. That also tells you the necessity for prayer. If you don't watch and pray, when temptation comes, it's very possible you're going to enter into it. Okay. And again, a second time, verse 42, he went away and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. See how it's morphed? First he's going, if, is it possible? But then he's got a pretty good idea the second time. It doesn't sound like it's possible. If, if, he's still not settled, though. If this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, in other words, unless I do this thing, your will be done. 
And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy, and left them, went away again, prayed the third time, saying the same words. So it morphed. But basically, he got to the place where he settled it in his heart. It took him three hours. I don't know how long it'll take you. But this is the prayer you pray. Um, how many of you are glad that Jesus exchanged his reluctance for grace, strength, and the will to obey? Anybody here glad? I sure am. But just think, how many people are going to be glad you pray this prayer so you fulfill the will of God for your life? Because there are some people, only you have the key to their heart. They'll listen to you. Note that there was not a hint of reluctance or regret or second guessing, guessing once he had finished this prayer. I mean, he was, what, what did he say? Look at here. Rise, let us be going. See my betrayers at hand. He knew Judas was coming. And he said, okay, let's go do it. He's got it now. He's got the grace to do it. He's got this thing settled in his heart. And he's, he's got the grace, the strength, everything he needs. And he goes and he does it. Don't think that we cannot pray this prayer if we're dealing with some of the same stuff because we're not greater than Jesus. Number five, the united prayer. <clears throat> um, united prayer is found in Acts chapter four. And let's look at Acts four, verse 24. Acts 4, verse 24. Peter and John have been threatened by the Pharisees not to preach or teach anymore in the name of Jesus. Verse 23, it says, And being let go, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. So when they heard that, they raised their voice to God, how? With one accord. That means in perfect harmony. They were one mind, one spirit. They were together. One accord. And said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and sea. And, and, and he goes on to explain the prayer. Group prayer does not constitute united prayer. How do we know when we reached one accord as, as, as a group. We're going to see the same results. Look at verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Physically, are you ready for this place to physically shake? Woo! Glory to God. I'm ready. I'm ready to see that. Okay? This group was so united in spirit, they were as one just as on the day of Pentecost. Hold your place here and go back to Acts 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. They were in perfect harmony and that's when the Holy Spirit woo, came down. Filled all the place where they were sitting. Okay? It's very possibly being under threat that caused this. There's something about being under threat that brings you together. And I said I would talk about this earlier. Now, this is just my opinion. So again, if you want to disagree with me, that's up to you. This is not thus saith the Lord, but I believe my opinion should have some weight. How many of you heard our present sitting president, which I believe was falsely elected, that's my opinion, through voter fraud, his latest move? Okay, Matt has... He has 
appointed through the Department of Homeland Security a woman to, she's called the uh, Ministry of Truth. Now, does that sound Orwellian or not? That's right out of 1984. Anybody here read the book 1984? Oh, yeah. Her purpose is to identify disinformation. Now, their definition of di disinformation is people coming against voter fraud. People uh, criticizing people like, you know, AOC and other liberal women are saying that is a threat to national security. And you can criticize conservatives all you want, doesn't matter. But if it's, if it's one of those, it's a threat to national security. Um, people criticizing the president administration, people criticizing, you know, making known through, through social media or whatever. That is <laughs> the greatest threat because I'm not going to stop talking. I'm not going to stop declaring the truth. Okay? That is, a, Gary Bauer says it's the, the greatest threat that he's ever seen so far. I want to read you. Now, mind you, this was 1944. This is a quote by Alexander Trukevsky at Madison Square Garden in New York, the National Convention of Communist Parties. This is his quote. When we get ready to take the United States, we will not take you under the label of communism. We will not take you under the label of socialism. We will take the United States under the labels made very lovable. We will take it under liberalism, under progressivism, under democracy. But take it, we will. That's 1944. They're making their threat good. And folks, we are in for a real fight. We got to know how to pray effectively. Many Christian leaders share my opinion that this is the most dire threat to our freedoms we've seen yet. You have to understand, Department of Homeland Security is the second most armed division of our government after the FBI. Hmm? Well, the Department of Defense, okay. But I'm talking about functions of government that's not military, okay? We may yet be threatened as they were not to speak the truth as we see it. And that's just something I'm going to not do. I'm not going to stop speaking the truth. Amen. So we may have need of united prayer. Okay, number, what is this, number six? The prayer of praise and worship. People don't see prayer that, or praise and worship as prayer. But it is. It is a legal exchange. Our heartfelt, sincere praise and worship. Okay? Ministering to the Lord. What do we exchange? Hmm? Huh? Huh? Well, our weakness for his. Amen. Isaiah 40. Turn to Isaiah 40. I knew you meant that, but. Isaiah 40, verse 28. Have you not known, have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary? His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak, and to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youths shall faint and be weary. 
All you young folks got lots and lots of energy. But even you will faint and be weary. The young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord. Now that's, that, the way it's worded there can be blind. This is wait like a waiter waits on you. Or a waitress waits on you in a restaurant. So you could, a better translation is he who ministers to the Lord shall renew his strength. The word renew means to exchange, literally. We exchange our weakness, our whatever we're dealing with, we exchange it. See, that's why praise and worship is not a time for you to just simply come in and go through the motions so we can get to the word of God. Folks, you enter in heartfelt, heartfelt. Praise and worship is not something done casually. You know, Pastor Marine was exhorting us today to worship and praise and understand what you're doing. But I see people still mechanically. They kind of mechanically go through. But when you really enter in, you're exchanging your weakness. Folks, you've had a week. How many times in a day, Scott, would you say you get up and down off the floor doing carpet and tile and all the stuff you do? A lot. Okay? Well, that gets, that, that gets taxing. How much are you on your feet, Matt, when you do your HVAC work? All day. You know, all of you, you, you all of you doing something different. There's, there's, you know, life just saps from us. It does. Amen. It saps from us. What do we got to do? We've got to, when we come in, when you lift your hands to God, when you enter in, I mean, really enter in, folks. And enough people did today where there was this exchange. And God was here to minister strength and might to you. Amen. So he's got, you know, he, he's got a way for you to get rid of your weakness and gain his strength. See, the Lord seeks real praise and worship, heartfelt spiritual praise and worship. Hold your place here in Isaiah 40. Go back to John 4. The Gospel of John, the fourth chapter. Jesus is talking to the woman at the well of Samaria. The one who had five husbands and, and is living with a man right now. Not in the right place with God. 4 verse 23. But the hour is coming now is when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit, out of our spirit, according to the word of God, truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is a spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So folks, when we do it God's way, God's seeking such. Heartfelt, spiritual praise and worship. It touches the heart of God. We can exchange our weakness. We can exchange our, our just lack of energy for his strength, his might, what we need, refreshing from the presence of the Lord. Glory to God. Many times when praise and worship starts, the last thing you feel like doing is praising and worshiping God. Anybody know what I'm talking about? But see, you enter in by faith. You start out not feeling like it. But I'll tell you, if you put yourself into it, God will meet you. You will exchange your weakness for his strength. His presence will come in and refresh you and renew you and fill you up again. Life saps life out of us. The life of God from us. God will put it back in. Now, 
There is the prayer of faith, but every one of these other prayers have to be done in faith. You have to do the same. With praise and worship, you have to do it by faith, not because you feel like it. I don't feel like praising when I first start out. Now, the praisers, they come prepared. They're ready. But you have to come and decide to enter in. It's a choice of your will. And I'll tell you, when all of us enter in, watch and see what's going to happen. When the biggest percentage of us enter in, we're going to bring the manifest presence of God down in a great and mighty way. Now let me talk about this just briefly as we finish up today. Prayer in the Greek, the word prayer, means to make a vow towards. A vow is a solemn promise or pledge. It is interesting that in the various kinds of prayer, we're making solemn promises back to God who made solemn promises to us in his blood covenant. So it's one way that God, we can make solemn promises back to him. For example, the prayer of faith is us making a solemn promise to stand in and speak only faith until we receive the manifestation. We believe we receive. And so we stand and speak only faith, stand in and speak only faith. All right. Faith ignores time. It is always what? Now. Faith spends its time rejoicing, praising, and thanking God that they have taken it, whatever it is, by faith, and it's theirs now. Tomorrow it will be theirs now. Two weeks it will be now. Six months it will be now. And like, if you're like Abraham, 25 years will still be now. It doesn't, usually though, if you're willing to stand forever, it doesn't take that long. And we've got better covenant established bond, better promises. The prayer of agreement is a solemn promise to stand in perfect symphonization in faith until the manifestation comes. Amen. And of course it's now. Because it is extended prayer of faith to someone else. Prayer of casting your cares upon the Lord. A solemn promise to throw all of your cares, worries, anxieties, frets, and stresses over on the Lord. And leaving there, leaving them there in exchange for his peace. Amen. Prayer of commitment, consecration, dedication to the will of God is a solemn promise to align your will with his will. It's prayed to the Father in Jesus' name. Oh, I wanted to point out something. I got beyond this. Um, if you notice, God kind of corrected me on something. Go back to Acts chapter 4. The Lord reminded me of this. Now we pray the prayer of faith, how? To the Father in Jesus' name. Prayer of agreement is prayed the same way. But, now the prayer of consecration, dedication, how did Jesus pray? He said, Father, if it be possible. Now he didn't use Jesus' name because he is Jesus. <laughs> he didn't need to unlock heaven because he was Jesus. Okay? And he had full access to the Father, because there was no sin separating them. Okay? But now, I want you to notice this. The Lord really pointed this out to me, and I thought that was interesting. I had not seen this before. Acts 4, verse 24. So when they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, what? Lord. Did they end it with Jesus' name? No. No. So in united prayer, not necessary. Prayer of casting your cares upon the Lord, not necessary. Amen. Because you're not, you're just exchanging something. You're not believing you receive something. Amen. Prayer of praise and worship, not necessary. Okay. Interesting. I'd, I'd not seen that before. Okay. So, Prayer of consecration, commitment, dedication to the will of God is a solemn promise to align your will with his will. United prayer is a solemn promise to be in one accord in perfect harmony as you pray as a group. Okay? Then 
The prayer of praise and worship is a solemn promise. And solemn means that you're very serious about it. I mean, you're serious in intent. You can be joyful, you can be happy, but you're still serious in your intent and purpose. It's a solemn promise to praise and worship the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, obviously not all directed to the Father in Jesus' name. Okay? So begin seeing prayer as a legal exchange. It will help you to receive more from God. And He wants you to receive what you need. I want you to see this. Turn. We'll close with this verse, John 16. Man, I'll tell you, when you get this, you're going to walk out of your shouting this morning. Hallelujah. John 16, verse 23. Jesus said, in that day, the day that he left earth, in that day you will ask me nothing. Why? Because when he was there, they asked him things. He said, in that day you'll ask me nothing. <coughs> Excuse me. Most assuredly, I say to you, Whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Up till now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive that your joy may be full. You get answers to prayer, it increases your joy. Amen. Glory to God. You know, this week, Scott Montserrat asked me if, if I could do a landscape job because they got their last rental property for their rental group. There's four businessmen that are all together in that business group. So I did a landscape job this week, which I'm not doing a lot of, but I did one this week. And uh, it took a lot out of me, but I just was trusting God for strength and so forth. But you know, man, I'll tell you, that last day, Lisa had to go. Lisa and Zach were helping me uh, some. And uh, she had to go and take Zach to play practice. And, and I was all by myself. And I was just like, oh, man, I think maybe I'll just quit. And I, something on the inside said, no, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. And so I just pushed on through. I got her done. And they came for the last hour after they were done with play practice and helped me. But I'll tell you, there's something. You know, the Bible says, hope deferred makes the heart sick. But when the desire comes, it's a tree of life. Man, I'll tell you, I just sucked in that tree of life. I was just like, oh, glory to God. I'm so glad I'm done. And they, they've got it listed now, so it needs to be done. And it looks marvelous. It looks marvelous. But what I want you to see ask and you shall receive that your joy may be full. I was joyful because I was done. Oh, glory to God. I got the strength they needed to get it done. They can sell it now because it looks good. People are coming by, walking by on the street going, man, that place has really changed. You're really making that look nice. And we got a whole bunch of comments like that, didn't we? And, you know, greater street appeal. We're getting people coming and they have one of those codes that you can take a picture of with your phone, you know, and scan and and so they're coming, taking pictures of it. And so I don't know, you probably already got that thing sold. <laughs> Glory to God. What am I saying? God wants you to receive. He wants you to receive. He gets glory when you receive. He says, ask that you may receive, that your joy may be full. He wants your joy to be full. Glory be to God. See, I, I, the devil comes and says, oh, God doesn't really want you to have that. That is baloney with a capital B. Ask that you may receive. That your joy may be. Amen. And we're going to go ahead and receive our offering this morning. But this morning... There's something special that we are going to also be receiving. Now, we, we want to receive the regular offering and then the other one? Okay. We'll do it together then. So, regular tithes and offerings to the church. But this is International Rhema Day. And, you know, if you appreciate the teaching that you get here, a lot of it has to do with Kenneth Hagin. And the, the school that he, you know, the two years of schooling I got down there, the one year my wife got down there, 
Um, and it laid a foundation. Now that's not all, you know, because I took a lot of time to study, to pray, to seek God. And so, but, but it was the foundation. And thank God, you know, Donna's brother Barry and Adrienne Jensen, you know, that are ministering to the Ukraine. Um, oh, by the way, just a little update. They are getting finances come in to them every day for the Ukraine, and they are like a clearinghouse, and they send off the money and different things that they get to help people that are in great need in the country of Ukraine. And so, you know, but they, they're, they're graduates of Ramah. And, and so, glory be to God, you know, it, it, it's been a blessing to us. It's part of the minister, ministry, uh, minister's organization, Rhema Ministerial Organiza- uh, Organization, RMAI, R- Ministerial Association International. Uh, I'll get it. Uh, so it's part of the group that I'm, I'm, I'm associated with and ordained through. And so... Uh, we do have roots here, and so this is to help people. So as we've received the offering, you can make it out to Eternity Church if you're making out a check or make you know the envelope, and then specifically mark um, Rhema, R-H-E-M-A, um, which is the Greek word for the word of God being a personal word to you. So R-H-E-M-A and the amount that you're designating. So let's pray as we get ready to receive. Father, we just thank you so much for this offering. We thank you for the word that we've received. Thank you, Lord, for the obedience of Kenneth Hagin to go teach my people faith and to persist, persist and be faithful. And thank you, Lord, because of that. This church is here that... We're learning the truth, how to tap into you and uh, live in victory every day. We just thank you now that we can bless others who are going to be trained up to go all over the world to bring this message to the masses. We just thank you, Father, now for directing each one of us in tithes, offerings, and in International Rhema Day. In Jesus' name. And everybody agree to that said? Amen. If you make out a check today, you can make it out to Eternity Church Market EC. Designate for R-H-E-M-A and the amount you're giving to Rhema. And then uh, if you're giving cash, you want a tax deductible receipt. If we didn't get you already, you can lift up your hand. And then you can designate on the envelope Rhema. Glory to God. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord. So I want to remind you of Times of prayer, we have prayer after Wednesday night services for half an hour. We have prayer on Saturday nights for one hour. And fulfilling what Jesus said, what could you not watch with me one hour? And so we're effectually and fervently praying for our country. And uh, we're believing that God is healing our land. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care what it seems like. I don't care what the threat is. God is healing our land in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's all stand. Let's present our tithes and offerings to him. Say this out loud. Because you believe it, say, Heavenly Father, Father, Lord Jesus, Jesus, we bring our tithes. We we give our offerings offerings according to your word. word. And we know know that if we're rich toward you, that you you will bless us back back in an immeasurable way. Press down, shaken together, and running over. Press down, shaken together, and more than enough, super abundance, super abundance. Overflow. overflow. The blessings of God, blessings of coming, God. Upon us coming upon and us chasing us down. and chasing us down. In Jesus' name. In Jesus name. Amen.